I'm a bit of a biologist by inclination and trade and, and use of excess multisyllabic words. Uh, what I'm really interested in, though, is, is how our environment, our stress history, affects who we become and who we are. Uh, I choose to study biological mechanisms because they give me a handle on how that stuff works. Uh, and I, I'm here to tell you, following on, on Ed, about how early life stress has an impact on that biology. So I think as many speakers are, have already emphasized, stress isn't just a matter of psychology. I think that a lot of us grew up imagining that, that if we're stressed out, that that's, that's because we're having a psychological problem with our situation, you know, and, and maybe we would be less stressed out if we were psychologically better at dealing with that situation. But, but stress really isn't simply a psychological response. I mean, as a neuroscientist, I, I have to say that my belief is that everything that's happening to us that we think of as psychological is really a phenomenon that's happening in our physical brain. Uh, people may differ with me on that, but I think it's important to remember that there's a lot of evidence that the psychological is the physical, okay? Stress gets under our skin to become biologically embedded. So our history of stress, particularly our early life stress, is something that becomes part of our biology as we go through life. We remember the stressful events. And I think Ed has talked a little bit about why that's important, you know, why uh, young infants and children and even adults might look at the stressful event, events in their lives and use them to predict how the world's gonna be. When Ed talked about this di dysregulation that's happening in infants, you know, and how the world becomes a threat. If the world is a threat, if you are in a family of origin that is difficult and is, is violent, or you're in a community that is difficult and is violent, learning to detect threats quickly is important, right? That's why that baby was so quick to get its arm up when it saw that angry face, because you don't have a lot of time, you know, if you're about to get hit, to make that decision to protect yourself. And so our biology is built to keep us alive, right? It is built to adapt to the conditions that we find ourselves in. So the effects of stress are, are long-lasting uh, biologically, but they're the most mutable and the biggest impressions seem to be made in early life. And to give you an example of the biology, this is uh, some work that was actually done in an animal model. This is just three weeks of stress, and this is a normal animal. This is a, a neuron from this, the hippocampus, uh, one of those words that I forced you to, to, <laughs> to utter. The hippocampus is a really important region, though, in our brains because it's where we, where we form our memories, right? It's how we know how to navigate in space, right? Uh, it also is important in how we remember other people. It's part of our social memory. Uh, it's how we learn to inhibit uh, inappropriate responses in our environment. We need a hippocampus, right? Uh, but if you're stressed, in this case, just for three weeks of chronic stress of, of uh, being dominated by another animal in this environment, these neurons shrink, right? And so the hippocampus becomes less able to perform its function. You may have noticed that you only tend to lose your keys on bad days, right? You never, you don't do that stuff on good days. It's only when you're already 30 minutes late that the keys you can't find and stuff. The reason for that is, is right here, right? When you're stressed out, your hippocampus is not functioning as well. And just in case you don't want to believe me because I'm talking about animal models, here's, here's some, some data from humans. In humans, if you look at the volume of the hippocampus, the gray matter volume, uh, and you ask them to report their level of stress, you'll see that the higher level of stress they report, chronic stress over time, the smaller their hippocampus will be. And this is true across a variety of conditions that cause stress hormones to be released or cause res dysregulation in the stress axis. So if you're depressed for a long time, your hippocampus gets smaller. Uh, if you have diseases you know, that cause overexpression of stress hormones, your hippocampus gets smaller. And in fact, almost all of the major neuropsychiatric diseases that, that I'm interested in and that, that affect a lot of people in, in our society and others uh, show this kind of pattern. And a lot of this pattern we're starting to think emerges in early life, where people from difficult early environments have this shrinkage going in, and so they have less resilience in their brain systems as they become adults or adolescents and they have to face new challenges. So they're less able, they're more challenged already. The important thing, at least for the context of children and young adulthood, though, is that a lot of these effects are at least partially reversible. You can go through a really stressful spell in life, and you can forget where your keys are, or maybe even forget where your house is. Um, and you can recover from that when you hit a good spell, right? So it's not that the, these things are permanent. And I, and I think that's one of the important things that I want to emphasize in this talk, is that childhood is really plastic. But it doesn't mean just because you had 
a bad interaction with your mom for a second or so, or because one person smacked you at some point in your childhood, that you are doomed, you know, to effect, have all these effects, a, a shrunken hippocampus and never remember your keys for the rest of your life. You have a lot of ca capacity to gain back that loss of function that happens during a chronic stress. It seems as we get much older, that's much more difficult. But at least through young adulthood and adolescence, we have a lot of ability to rescue these kinds of effects. And I think that's really important. I'm, I'm gonna talk a lot about what's negative in terms of early life stress, but I think it's important to remember that the brain really is plastic and can change if we can change the environment that it finds itself in. Okay. And so a lot of what we know about how these uh, effects are mediated is through this hormone in humans called cortisol. It's what binds to the glucocorticoid receptor. So okay, I explain one more uh, $40 term that I, <laughs> I use, uh, which is a receptor that interacts with the, the nucleus of your neurons, and so it changes the way your, your neurons behave. But it do, does things throughout your body. Acutely, it's useful, you know? So a stress response is useful if something is stressful, if you have to deal with the threat. Um, so you enhance your immune function with this. You get better memory, you get better energy replenishment, you get better cardiovascular function. But if you're chronically stressed, you have effects on a lot of different systems. Your bones uh, become weaker, uh, you have muddle, muscle wasting, you're pushed towards a state in which you might get diabetes or metabolic syndrome. So excess of stress hormones has effects on a lot of different systems. This isn't just about mental health, it's about physical health. Um, and the early environment has turned out to be very important in setting how this stress axis works throughout our lives. This is over here is a rat mother, um, and the rat mothers were one of the first ways that we got out the problem of how is maternal interaction programming babies? And we do that because rats are easy and there's a lot of them and, and it's a little less complex system to work in than, than, than in humans. Uh, but they do have relevance to, to human lives. And this is work mainly by uh, Michael Meany and others where they looked at the natural variation in the maternal behavior of rat moms. And rat moms show variation in maternal behavior just like human moms do. Some of them are very low uh, in terms of the amount of licking and grooming they do of their babies, and some of them are very high. And if you look, though, at the babies who have high licking and grooming mothers, they tend to, as mothers themselves, show the same behaviors, and their grandchildren show the same behaviors. And it turns out that this is mediated through this behavior, right? So these little rat pops are learning, essentially, almost like a culture of, of parenting uh, from their mothers that they pass on. And it turns out that this is actually embedded in something called the epigenome. So there are chemical changes happening in their brains that affect not only their maternal behavior, but how they react to stress as adults. The mothers who show low licking and grooming, their offspring are much more reactive to stress as they grow up. They're much more anxious, and they also show the low licking and grooming phenotype. I'd be careful about, you know, making perfect analogies between rats and people. You know, uh, I don't recommend licking your babies, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't judge, but, but I, I wouldn't go straight to highly licking your babies just because I said, said that that's, that's a good thing in a rat. And, and I think that's another important point to emphasize is this, all of this behavior is adaptive to some degree or another. So what we're talking about here, and I think often when people talk about this particular series of experiments, they talk about the high licking and grooming mothers as the better mothers. And I think a lot of what we're talking about here in terms of the challenges that mothers have forgets that sometimes this lower investment strategy is the strategy that's available and adaptive to the environment. Rats have all this variation in behavior for reasons of their biology, reasons of their environments too. And, and I think that that's one thing that often, you know, motherhood is this concept where there's a lot of judgment placed on mothers uh, and there's a lot of maybe over-focus on mothers, I think, in terms of a lot of what we're going to talk about today because mothers are usually the primary caregiver but they're not always the source of stress you know as ed said you know you can have a sick baby um you can be sick yourself and be unable to cope as well you know so i think it's important to, to emphasize that mothers are not the only problem uh and that all maternal behavior is is not you know to be judged on a scale of, of high to low good to bad yeah um and just to emphasize that this sort of epigenetic change is not something that's distinct just to the rats that I like to interact with on a regular basis, um, but also to humans, is there's now a fairly lengthy literature that was started by Rachel Yehuda and others uh, showing that 
your vulnerability to post-traumatic stress disorder is predicated on who your parents were, and in some cases now, who your grandparents were. So if you're the child of a Holocaust survivor, you have alterations in the methylation status, the epigenetic status of your glucocorticoid receptor in your body and your brain. And you're more likely to wind up with PTSD than your cousin whose uh, grandparents escaped the Holocaust, right? So these huge life stressors that affect parents get passed on to children. And there's now evidence that actually, as in the RAP model, this kind of stuff can be passed on to grandchildren. So again, it's much less simple than just mothers and infants, you know, it's, it's the whole extended family and, and to some extent maybe the whole society uh, that plays a role in how infants' uh, brains function, how they grow up, uh, and what they pass on to their own offspring. So I wanted to introduce uh, a concept that was developed by Vincent Folletti and uh, Robert Anda at the CDC some years ago, and this is uh, something that I think is very useful to me from a, the perspective of a basic scientist, and, 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 uh, but I also, also think a really important rhetor rhetorical tool from the public health perspective. And this is the adverse child experiences scale. And what this is, is a one to 10 scale that includes uh, phenomena like sexual abuse, emotional abuse, uh, parental incarceration, parental in interparental violence, a number of other things. And it's not about the number of times it's happened, it's just the number of individual things that a, a child or a person has been exposed to. Uh, and it turns out to be a really profound predictor of a whole bunch of different things. You have these adverse childhood experiences, you have the follow-on social, uh, emotional, and cognitive impairment often. Uh, you have adoption of behaviors that might be risky, uh, say smoking or drinking early. Uh, then you wind up with an increased risk of disease, disability, and social problems, and in many cases you die earlier than you might otherwise be expected to be. And to give you an idea of how significant effect of, uh, this effect is, if you think about the risk of lung cancer from smoking, it's about a, a two or threefold increase in risk from being a smoker for say 20 years over someone who's not. If you look at the, the risk of all kinds of cancers from having four or more out of 10 of these ACEs, it also increases your risk by about two or threefold. So this is for your risk of cancer alone as big a risk as smoking, right? And I think that's important to remember that adverse childhoods really are a tremendous public health problem that we need to pay attention to with, with all the force that we brought to anti-smoking, anti-alcoholism, anti-drug campaigns and things like that, these other risks to our health. Um, so the important question for, for basic researchers like me is, how are we remembering this stuff? You know, as Ed said, you know, infants are interacting and there, there's memories being formed, but these aren't explicit memories. You know, I don't remember anything from my first two, two years of life, and yet we know that they're important. So how are these things encoded? We know it can't really be the genes because the genes don't change at all across your lifespan. Um, sorry about that. Getting the throat mic there, sorry. Uh, so the explanatory fr framework that we've come up with as basic researchers is this idea of epigenetics. And this is basically the molecular interaction, you know, although it's not as simple as that, between our genes and our environment, right? And the simplest definition of this, or the broadest, is merely information that's transmitted al above the level of the genes. And I like to lead with that particular definition as opposed to some of the more restricted and uh, molecular definitions because it points to the importance of things like our culture, our family environment. These are all things, means by which we transmit information above the level of our genes. You know, our language is epigenetic perhaps in this definition. You know, our culture is epigenetic. And so these are things that really influence who we become and interact actually with our biology. And to give you the, the one heavy molecular figure, uh, I won't uh, belabor this, but basically what the molecular mechanisms of epigenetics are, are a number of different molecules that are interacting directly with the DNA and determining which genes are being expressed at different times. So we know now that if you look at the gene for this glucocorticoid receptor, the stress hormone receptor, that it's going to be decorated with more of this DNA methylation chemical modification if you've had a very stressful early life and you will express it less in your brain uh, and you will be less able to regulate your stress response as a consequence. Um, and this is something that again has shown up not just in animal models of stress but also 
in humans. Uh, this is another paper by Rachel Yehuda's group uh, where she took this risk of PTSD and actually took it down to this molecular level. And what she showed is that you see differences in the, the methylation status, again, of this, this stress hormone receptor that vary across whether or not your parents had PTSD or not, right? And it turns out that the, the biggest risk or the one that causes the biggest change in methylation is paternal PTSD. So if your father had PTSD, it is much more likely that you're going to have this increased methylation, and that molecularly is increasing your risk of PTSD and mental disorders associated with that as well. It's not as simple as all that, um, and it's interesting too that if both parents have PTSD, you actually lose some of this effect. You know? uh, so what I think will come up a lot today uh, is it's, it's complicated. Uh, it's, it's not simple. But we do, or we are starting to have a handle on these kind of molecular mechanisms that help us understand how our biology changes because of who our parents are, how we interact with them, with them both on the micro scale and the macro scale level, and how uh, we're exposed to these things, even across generations. You know, So we went from, from moments to generations in the space of two talks. Uh, but these really are an intergenerational, cross-generational kind of phenomenon. Um, I'd like to also emphasize that epigenetic r research is really in its early days. You know, I know I'm supposed to talk about how cool and how, how, how powerful and how uh, what I do explains everything up here, but I think that that would be a little dishonest of me as a scientist. There's a lot we don't know about that, and that's, to me as a scientist, what makes it as exciting, but it's also something to be cautious about because I think, again, often this kind of biological basis for things makes it seem like you've done something permanent. Or, or bad if you cause a change in this mark or that mark. And I really don't think that this should be as used as a tool for that. I think far too often biology has been used for a tool for certain social views, and I, I'd like to avoid that as much as possible. I think biology should be a tool to liberate us all. Um, we also don't understand a whole lot about the timing of these changes in humans. We've been able to do a lot in rats, but in fact we, we know almost nothing about how these epigenetic changes are happening in, in human infants and human children. Um, so I think going forward, there's a lot of basis for very interesting research in this area. And the big question is, can using these markers, using these changes, can we build interventions uh, that can change the course of these epigenetic grooves, these changes in behavior, these changes in our brains, uh, so that we can rescue, you know, perhaps a bad couple of years in an early, in an infant's life, you know, or a child's life and turn them to the better. Uh, because I think, again, there's, there's a lot of emphasis placed on the negative public health outcomes of, of early life stress and adversity, and they are real and they are important. But I think what we should look to is how can we rescue that? How can we save those kids? Uh, and with that, I think I will uh, end with this view of syllables. Uh, thank you very much.